the philosophy of the true believers differs from the philosophy of us, the questioners. And it differs in a very fundamental way. Because to us, lovers of true science, we bear in mind your great saying, guilt verloren, nichts verloren. Mut verloren, alles verloren. The reputation of science is at stake. The future of the Enlightenment and the age of reason is at stake. Because their philosophy differs from ours. And it was expressed by one of your German poets. If I could remember how it went. <laughs> and he, uh, the point of what he said was, Dien nicht um Glauben. Dien um Geld. Gott gibt wie es geht in jener Welt. That is their philosophy. It is not ours. So that is the difference. And what I want to look at then, in the light of that difference, is what policy should those who are still pretending to negotiate in Paris agree upon? And these are the main points. First of all, here from, you, uh, I think, uh, her Professor Dr. Lüdecker will be pleased with this one. Here is Le Quere et al., the CDAC results for the amount of CO2 emissions of mankind, and you will see that they are slightly above the business as usual case as it was presented by the IPCC in 1990. 21 years of negotiations have made not the slightest difference to the trajectory on which CO2 emissions are following. What's more, this year's talks not only have achieved nothing, they will achieve nothing, because Mr. Obama decided, of his own initiative in December last year, to visit China and give them an exemption from any controls whatsoever on the emissions of carbon dioxide. India is understandably and rightly demanding a similar concession. Such concessions should also be offered to all the countries of Africa and of South America. And once you have done that, then the little difference that we in the West can make will be negligible. Because although we have tended to come to think that it is the West that dictates what happens to the world, the world is much bigger than the West even if we shut down our industries and economies altogether, which is exactly what our governments are trying to do, that would make no difference whatsoever to the inexorable continuation of the increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration. So first, I have listed for you here, with great diligence, all the democratic provisions in the Paris Agreement. As you will see, there aren't any. And there should be. If this process is not going to be democratic, the likelihood is that it will be totalitarian. And we have seen in the recent history of Europe where that can lead. So we are looking also at the political future as well as the scientific future of the world. The stakes are very high indeed. For this reason, it is necessary that every country who signs up to the Paris Agreement should be entitled at one year's notice to withdraw from the entire ghastly process because one by one, countries are going to notice that there is no longer a problem with the climate. And they will not want to be bound to hideously expensive, economically destructive, job-destroying policies when on the science and on the increasingly on the increasing evidence of the temperature record, which is not changing, there is no need to do anything about global warming at all for the good and sufficient reason that it is not happening. So the secession clause is important. With some friends, I managed to get it inserted into the second draft of the Paris Agreement earlier this year, and it has survived through until the draft that was still available last night. With luck, this 
secession clause, this right of any country to give one year's notice and leave, will survive. And if it does survive into the final draft, then do not believe any headlines to say that a legally binding agreement ha has been reached because it will not have been, because there is a legal right to withdraw. We are also suggesting, though I think this will not be included in the, in the current draft, but we're going to try for future treaties, that there should now be an independent judicial inquiry into the future of this process. There are three particular questions that uh, inquiry should address. The first is whether there is a scientific consensus that recent warming was mostly man-made, and whether even if there were, that would, scientifically speaking, be of the least importance. Secondly, whether official estimates of climate sensitivity, that's how much warming we're going to get on all time scales, are credible. And thirdly, whether the cost of adaptation exceeds that of mitigation. Those are the questions which an independent inquiry should invite the world to submit evidence to it on. It should then hear evidence from both sides and allow each side to cross-examine the other in the normal rules of evidence and court procedure. For that procedure is a very good way of resolving disputes of this kind. And it is time that we told the other side that they can no longer declare that they are right and everybody else must be wrong. Let the court decide that and they are going to get a surprise. There should also be a sunset clause. If the rate of warming continues to be negligible to zero, continuing with this process is surely not only pointless but cruel. And I'm saying that if in any 20-year period over this century there is less than one-sixth of a degree of warming over that period, then the entire treaty process, all these various agreements and all the obligations thereunder should fall away forthwith and for I. Let's sweep the whole nonsense away. Those are my proposals for this treaty. Do I hear agreement? What a pleasure it is to be addressing rational, scientific human beings. <laughs> there is one further matter which my lovely wife asked me to raise before you as I was setting off to catch the train. She said, you've won the scientific argument between you, but there is also a moral argument. And you very seldom, she said, argue the moral case. So let me argue it briefly now. 1.2 to 1.4 billion of our fellow citizens of this planet do not have access to electricity. Therefore, they are more prone to disease and death than are we, and their life expectancy is 30 to 40 years shorter than ours. To put it another way around, between 10 and 20 million people every year are being killed because it is the policy of the governments of the world to deny them cheap, clean, reliable, low-tech, continuous, coal-fired electricity. Are we agreed that the priority, the absolute number one priority of these negotiations in all future years should be to ensure that every citizen of our planet has access to fossil fueled electricity? There is another aspect of the moral dimension, and that is that some of us suspect that there is some element of fraud, of deception, of what the Swiss would call escroquerie, in the official case for alarm about global warming. And the recently formed Independent Committee on Geoethics, founded in Prague earlier this year, has established a fraud investigation team, and you are looking at the chief investigator. <laughs> and we are going very quietly to investigate certain frauds, which I shall outline to you briefly a bit later on. But first, what is fraud? 
Fraud by false representation is the particular category of fraud we are looking at. And a false representation is to make an untrue or misleading express or implicit representation dishonestly, knowing it is or may be untrue or misleading, and intending by the deception to make a gain for oneself or another, or to cause a loss or risk of loss to another. That is what fraud is in law. Now, a representation is any evidenced, express or implicit representation to a person or machine by word, deed or omission, as to fact or law, whether or not any recipient believed it, was affected by it or acted on it. It includes failure to correct a false impression after a change in circumstances following an earlier representation by the accused. As I shall show, there have been many changes of scientific circumstances since the UN's climate panel first made its predictions in 1990, and they have not take, taken sufficient account of those changes. A false representation is one which is intentionally untrue or misleading, and the accused actually knows, rather than merely suspects, that it is or may be untrue or misleading. What is a gain? A gain is keeping what one has or getting what one doesn't have. Loss is not getting what one might get or parting with what one has, whether temporary or permanent, in money or any other real or personable, tangible or intangible property. And in some countries, you have to be able to put a monetary value on that before you can allege fraud. No gain or loss need actually be made. It is solely the intention that establishes the offence, and that's the case in all jurisdictions. Now, scientifically illiterate ministers, like the ones who are negotiating in Paris, are not fraudsters. Scientists doing their best and just screwing up as we all do are not fraudsters. Ignorant climate campaigners, however full of hatred and malice, are not fraudsters. Ill-educated journalists are not fraudsters, and useful idiots of whom, as Lenin said, there are always plenty, <laughs> are not fraudsters. But scientists deliberately publishing or endorsing methods or results that they know are or may be false, intending thereby to gain for themselves or others or to cause loss to others, they are fraudsters. Now... <laughs> any fraud investigator begins by seeing whether there is a climate of corruption, whether there is an atmosphere or environment of deception. And he looks for red flags pointing to the need for him to investigate. So I'm going to go very quickly through these red flags. Now, just a few of them. You heard some of them from Herr Pulse in his excellent talk yesterday. But I'm going to go through, through them again. First of all, they don't tell us what the ideal global mean surface temperature is. And they don't tell us what variance either side of that ideal temperature is okay for species on Earth. After all, we've survived 4 billion years, or 6,000 years, depending on your point of view, of evolution. And if we've survived 4 billion years of evolution, then we're pretty good at adapting even to quite large changes in our environment and in our climate. These questions are not addressed by the UN's climate panel or by those advocating doom and gloom. Likewise, another red flag, they offer no benchmarks or performance indicators as any business or indeed any scientific institution would if a scientist relentlessly get his predictions wrong over and over and over again then I would say to him, I'm sorry, mate, you're going to have to find a job doing something else. Have you tried gardening? <laughs> <laughs> then they seem curiously reluctant to address the actual data. Now, me, when I was taught science, I was taught you start with the data. You take some measurements, you do some observations, and then you think about them and you try to apply existing theory to them so as to advance the theory a little further. Thus, inch by inch, science advances. The sea is barely warming. Until I calculated the linear trend 
on the Argo bathythermograph record for the 11 full years for which we have that record, nobody knew that the, the top two kilometers of the ocean is warming at a rate of only one Celsius degree every 430 years. Is this terrifying? No. And what's more, that warming is occurring from below because the measurements made by the boys are stratified. The upper layers of the ocean are not warming at all. And the, lowest the layers further down are warming progressively more. And that means the warming isn't coming from the atmosphere above, it's coming from down below, possibly through a slightly greater activity of the three and a half million subsea volcanoes that we don't even monitor. I can't tell you why the warming is coming from below, but I can tell you that it is coming from below. And they don't mention that, and that's a red flag. They certainly don't mention the pause in global temperature for the last 18 years and nine months, and that's a red flag, except to deny its existence. Here is a paper by Carl et al. from NOAA earlier this year. Now, I've just established to you that the troposphere measured by the RSS satellites, that's the air above the surface, isn't warming, and the ocean at the surface isn't warming, but Carl et al. say that the surface in between those two non-warming uh, fluid media is warming. I should love to see what their understanding of the laws of thermodynamics actually is. It is clearly impossible, the conclusion of their paper. They make exaggerated predictions, and then they pay no attention when those predictions fail. And that's a very big red flag. Here are the IPCC's predictions made in 1990 for the period up until today. And they will see down at the bottom all five of the principal data sets, NASA, GIS, HADCRT4, NCEI, and then the two satellite ones in green at the bottom, RSS and UAH. Those are well below the lowest warming predicted in 1990. And yet we are told with more and more certainty that the IPCC is right when the data say it is wrong. That's a red flag. In fact, the observed warming rate has not in any year since 1950 come anywhere close to the warming rate predicted by the IPCC in 1990. That's another red flag. Not in any year has it done that. The models have failed and failed and failed again. Here, done by Dr. Carl Mears of RSS, is analysis of the predictions of 33 IPCC models against, in black, the RSS satellite data, and you can see how rapidly the exaggerations of the models are diverging from the far less exciting curve of real-world temperature change, and that's a red flag. And here, in the mid-troposphere, you will see that all of 73 models have exaggerated compared with the real world. Even the IPCC is slowly beginning to admit this. In their, in their fifth assessment report, they have said that 111 of 114 models have exaggerated temperature change. And yet, they go on telling us there is a problem on the basis of the very models that they know are not working. And that's a red flag. Here is the Met Office model, model which has failed. And that's a red flag. And when a journalist recently mildly criticised the Met Office for getting its forecast so wrong by allowing too much for global warming, and he then allowed the Met Office a very full and fair right of reply, which was all broadcast, the BBC took the entire programme off the air and ordered all tapes and ta transcripts to be destroyed. The very organisation which in Britain is supposed to guarantee freedom of speech is destroying it, and that's a red flag. Here, even the most recent models, the CMIP-5 models, fail. This is, again, an analysis done by Dr. Carl Mears at RSS, and that's a red flag. Even the IPCC admits its models are running hot, but it buries this in a tiny corner of a page-sized graph. This is about the size of a postage stamp. Here, enlarged so that you can see it. The fact that they try to conceal these facts is a red flag. Here is the over-predictions of methane. You can see 1990, 1995, 2001, 2007, their first four assessment reports. And the actual outturn in black at the bottom up to 2012 
And once again, enormous exaggerations, and yet you still hear everyone in the IPCC and everyone in the environmental movement talking about a cow fart tax, for which there is no need, and also talking about the need to persuade everyone that they should eat vegetables. Well, I, for one, am British. I shall continue to eat good red roast beef. <laughs> And then, there is another red flag. They themselves are beginning to have to revise their short to medium term predictions. In red, overlapping in yellow there, were their predictions in 1990. The predictions for 2013 are in green, again overlapping a bit in yellow there. And you can see how much they have brought their predictions down. And yet the demands for closing down the West in the name of saving the planet from what the IPCC itself is now implicitly admitting is a non-problem is what was on the agenda at Paris in the last two weeks. And the fact that this has not been made more of, the fact also that the IPCC has not adjusted its longer-term projections in line with its adjustments in the shorter-term projections, that is a red flag. The fact that sea level is barely rising, and yet they add a purely spurious and artificial and actually non-existent glacial isostatic adjustment so as to make it look as though it is rising, that's a red flag. That the fact that they predicted a water vapour feedback that would on its own double the direct warming from CO2, but on some measures such as here the ISCCP uh, um, analysis, there is not only no water vapour feedback, but in the crucial mid-troposphere where that feedback would have the most effect, the water vapour has in fact been declining, and yet they do not adjust their models to take account of this. That is a red flag. The fact that it is the sun, I'm grateful to Dr. Willie Soon, who's sitting just here, a co-author of mine, a very distinguished scientist. He has shown that in some records, not in all, changes in solar activity precede and appear to have some sort of causal link with, we can't prove this, of course, but it is at least suggestive, of the temperature change. The solar change in red, the temperature change in blue. The fact that they constantly downplay the influence of the sun on the climate, as you heard from Willie earlier, that's a red flag. Then the fact that, uh, as Marcel Kroc said to you, uh, climate sensitivity is falling, but they continue not to admit this, that's a red flag. In fact, if we look at... <coughs> Uh, a few of the studies that have come out in recent years, here plotted on a single graph, you can see the downtrend. It is a very sharp downtrend. But no, we're still told the problem is as big as it was when it started. That's a red flag. In the 1930s, in fact, there were more all-time temperature highs in the United States than there are today. But you won't hear that mentioned by those who are talking about the recent drought in California. And that's a red flag. They don't mention that Greenland, according to some studies, such as this one by Johannesson in 2005, is actually increasing its ice mass in the high plateau, though it's losing a little around the coast. The fact that they don't mention these balancing considerations, that's a red flag. The fact that hurricanes are unchanged, as Herr Pulse pointed out to you yesterday, that's a red flag. Here it is with cyclones as well. And then droughts. They've actually, this is the most comprehensive survey ever conducted of the percentage of the global land area under drought. It took Howe et al. several years to compile this by going back to records all over the world over the last 30 years. And that doesn't look like an uptrend in droughts to me. But they don't tell us this, and that's a red flag. And then rainfall. We hear a lot about rainfall. We've had quite heavy rainfall in the last two years in the UK. And this graph doesn't reflect those last two years. I have to qualify that. However, until I bothered to calculate what the trend had been up until that time, nobody else had done it. It turns out to be a dizzying, dizzying five centimetres of extra rainfall today as a trend compared with almost 250 years ago. This is the longest rainfall record in the world. It isn't terrifying, is it? but they are trying to pretend it is, and that's a red flag. Global sea ice extent and trend show virtually no change. If you had a heartbeat as healthy as this, you would be regarded as a very vigorous little planet. <laughs> so that's a red flag. As you heard yesterday again, annual extreme weather deaths have plummeted. This is a graph from our good friends at the Global Warming Policy Foundation. But do you hear them explaining that weather is not really killing very many people anymore? No. And that's a red flag. And here is the kind of thing that goes into the so-called peer-reviewed literature without anyone checking. 
This was a, a, a paper which said, oh, look how all the Atlantic hurricanes are increasing in their frequency, intensity, and duration, except that they aren't. <laughs> they published that bit, but they chose not to publish that bit. And that's a red flag. And then here is the U.S. Historical Climate Network. There's the actual data showing a downtrend since the beginning of the last century. And here's what gets published. And that's a red flag. And here's another example. This is the GIS record, same trick. And that's a red flag. And then you have the same phenomenon here at um, uh, Australia, at Darwin Airport. Joe Daleo kindly sent me this one. Here's another one. Uh, this came from the climate skeptics in New Zealand, and the same trick has been played there. They tried to take them to court in New Zealand, and the court said, well, we can't possibly not trust our meteorological bureau. Wakey, wakey, these people are making a lot of money out of fiddling around with the temperatures to try and make it look as though there's been more global warming than there has, and that's a red flag. And then, of course, there was the Himalayan glaciers, where for six months the accident-prone Indian railroad engineer, Rajendra Pachauri, said, there is nothing wrong with the IPCC's report. Anyone who criticizes it is a climate skeptic and ought to be locked up. <laughs> and then he had to admit, because Professor Bhatt of the Indian Geological Survey, who actually keeps the gla gla glacier records, and he has records going back 200 years to the time when India was properly run by the British Empire. <laughs> And he said, the pattern of advance and retreat is exactly as it always has been throughout the last 200 years. But that's not what Pachori wanted said, but in the end he had to. The fact that he resisted for so long, and the fact that the IPCC refused to correct Dr. Lewis's um, error that was identified, and Marcel Kroc mentioned that to you yesterday, those are red flags. The fact that the ozone, we were told, was going to be disrupted by ozone-depleting substances. Then in red there, the ozone depleters have been taken out of the atmosphere by the Montreal Protocol. But as of a few months ago, the ozone hole over the Antarctic was just about larger than at any time since records began in the 1950s. That's a red flag. Then the climate is a chaotic object. And that means, we, mathematically speaking, we can't actually predict its future states with any reliability. The IPCC admits this at paragraph 14.2.2.2 of its 2001 th uh, third assessment report. But somehow, they continue, nevertheless, to make predictions with 95 to 99% certainty. And that's a red flag. And then, of course, we have the appalling slaughter of birds throughout Scotland, Spain, and so many other countries, America, where they have put out these futile windmills. And the environmentalists are now the biggest threat to our environment. Then there are red flags that are fraud. You saw this graph yesterday, and it was shown to you that the y-axis had been stretched, as it is here, to make it look as though there's a grievous amount of warming. But the real fraud here is they're trying to say the rate of warming is ever-increasing and it's our fault. They use the word accelerating in the IPCC's fourth assessment report. But actually, there is no acceleration because there are two previous periods with precisely the same warming as the third period. And, of course, we've seen since then that temperatures have levelled off. So that's a red flag. Besides, if you take a sine wave and you apply the IPCC same dodgy method to, to that, you can get exactly the same pattern. And a sine wave has a zero trend by definition. So that's a red flag. And then, of course, they altered the, the final draft of the second assessment report, where five times the pre-final draft had said very clearly, we cannot identify any human influence on global temperature. And one man, Ben Santa, of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, was asked to rewrite it. He rewrote it, crossing out all five of those statements by the scientists and replacing them with a political opinion of his own, saying that the body of evidence now points to a discernible human influence on global climate. The consensus on global warming is the consensus of just one man. Then there is the hockey stick graph. I hardly need to tell you anything more about that, except you may be interested to see this graph. 
At the bottom there, there is Hubert Lamb's graph, which was adopted by the IPCC in its first assessment report, and above it, the record of sea level change over the same period, reconstructed by Grinstead et al. on basis of work by Jevredjeva et al. in 2009. They kind of fit together, don't they, as Al Gore might put it? And therefore, we might expect that since their theory dictates that if the temperature warms up, sea level rises, and their measurements show that sea level was higher in the Middle Ages than it is today, and lower in the Little Ice Age than it is today, then perhaps the hockey stick graph that does not show that pattern is wrong. But they don't say that, and that's a red flag. But I now want to look at the three central frauds in this debate. First, the central economic fraud. And I'm going to take a specific example to show you why it is not worthwhile, even if they're right about how much warming there is going to be, to take any steps to mitigate global warming today. This is the beautiful Jurassic coast of Dorset in England. It's a World Heritage Site. But along came sinister profiteering developers, and they planned to put 600 windmills, 200 metres high, only 14 kilometres off that coast. It would have wrecked the view over a 45-degree arc from Dulston Head, uh, up on the left there where the green coast sticks out. And the developers put out this graph to try to show how small and inoffensive the turbines were, but the red circles that I have added to this graph are the true size of each of these monsters. In fact, if you compare it with the height of Salisbury Cathedral or even the entire dimensions of Salisbury Cathedral, you can see what enormous windmills these would have been. But now we're going to do the mathematics to show just how absurd spending billions on these wind farms actually is. Now, the developers say there was going to be 970 megawatts of rated capacity, of which, uh, according to the Department of Energy and Climate Change figures, about 30% would, would be achieved. That's 290 megawatts. And that would mean that this wind farm, over its 20 years of lifetime, would remit 0.005% of global CO2 emissions foreseeable over that period that in turn would reduce the CO2 concentration at the end of that period from 463 to 462.997 parts per million. <laughs> Fantastic. What an achievement. Now, nobody has ever done these calculations before. That's why I show them to you now. And then, uh, that would abate... 0.00003 watts per square metre of forcing. That would, in turn, reduce global temperatures by 0.00001 Kelvin, and that would be achieved at a cost. The subsidy to this wind farm was going to be... This one wind farm was going to be $8.5 billion over its 25-year lifetime. 20-year 20, 20 lifetime, I'm sorry. And that means that for every Kelvin of warming forestalled, by measures as cost-ineffective as this wind farm, $850 trillion would have to be spent. And if you just look at the amount of warming the IPCC foresees over the period of that 20 years, you'd have to spend $300 trillion if you were going to try and stop that warning, warming by measures such as this. And if you then look at real global GDP over that 20-year period, that is 14% of the GDP that the World Bank foresees for that period. And then you look at the cost of adapting to 21st century warming according to the Stern Report of 2006 for the UK Treasury, uh, using his discount rate, which is about 1.4%, uh, about a third or a quarter of the minimum market discount rate, but he's doing that to try and make the numbers look right. It's still 7 to 70 times costlier to try to forestall global warming by measures as cost-ineffective as these windmills as it is to let it happen and pay the later and far lesser cost of adaptation. But what if you use a correct discount rate? of 5%. That's the absolute minimum that the peer-reviewed literature establishes as the discount rate you should apply for any such devices as these. And then you find that it is 45 to 450 times costlier to mitigate global warming today than to pay the cost, as estimated by Stern, and it's probably an exaggerated cost, of doing away with it later. So, the con economic conclusion is very straightforward. Individual projects do very little to cut CO2, and they do so at huge unit cost. Cost, what is more upfront, benefits, if there are any, 100 years away. Costs exceed 
the, ben the benefits if you use their artificially low discount rate by one to two orders of magnitude and make that two to three orders of magnitude if you use a real discount rate. And taxpayers throughout this are locked into 20-year subsidies on a massive and crippling scale. Then there is the 97% consensus fraud. And this, too, is a very damaging fraud. A paper was written in Australia by researchers from all over the world in 2013 which claimed that 97.1% of the abstract of 11,944 papers published over the 21 years 1991 to 2011 had said that uh, most of the global warming since 1950 or in the last few decades had been caused by us. I analysed the data file produced by the authors of that paper, they themselves had only marked 64 papers, or 0.5% of the sample, as saying what they had defined as the consensus and what the IPCC defines as the consensus. You see it there in red on the screen. 0.5. When we read those 64 papers, only 40, 41 of them actually said what they had said they had said. And so the true consensus about global warming is 0.3%. Because 99.7% of scientific papers on climate do not say that most of the global warming since 1950 was caused by us. But now I come to the central fraud. And this fraud is a really big one. This is the centre of the whole scam. They say the science is settled, but look at the range of predictions they make in their latest assessment report in the IPCC from 2015 to 2100. It's naught to four and a half Celsius of global warming over the next 85 years. And they tell us the science is settled. Here, and I must give a warning here, Achtung, Gleichungen, we're now going to look at some equations. This is the fundamental equation of climate sensitivity. It is different from the one that Marcel Kroch showed you yesterday. This is the more, if you like, the more grown-up version. And the left-hand part of that equation calculates the direct warming as a result of adding CO2 to the atmosphere. The right-hand half, with the red brackets, that is what's called the system gain caused by temperature feedbacks, so that if you get some direct warming, it is thought the climate responds with feedbacks, which might either amplify or attenuate the original warming, but the official theory is that they amplify it. Now we're going to have a look at this equation. There are only three inputs to it. The first is, of course, the radiative forcing. The second is the Planck climate sensitivity parameter. The third is the feedback sum. We'll look briefly at each of these. The Planck parameter is simply, uh, to a first approximation, the first differential of the, uh, the first derivative of the Stefan Boltzmann fundamental equation of radiative transfer applied at the characteristic emission altitude, which is approximately 10 kilometres above us here. And therefore, you take the known incoming radiation of 238 watts per square metre at that point, you use the equation, to, assuming an emissivity of approximately unity, which is more or less right up there, and that gives you 255 Kelvin of temperature, and that from that you can calculate the derivative. You do have to allow, however, for the Holder inequality in that the amount of radiation coming in at different parts of the spherical surface is going to vary, and the effect of that, I've done this calculation, is it's approximately seven-sixths of the straightforward derivative, and that gives you 0.313 Kelvin per watt per square metre, which for once the IPCC has got right. That is the correct figure. Now, then there's the radiative forcing at CO2 doubling, which is simply on the current understanding of the IPCC, 5.35 times the logarithm of proportionate change. If the proportionate change is a doubling, that'll be 5.35 times the natural logarithm of 2, which is 3.71 watts per square metre. Now, then we have the feedbacks. And you will see that in this graph from the IPCC's fifth assessment report, they make a direct comparison between the feedbacks they were using in the 2007 and 2013 reports. 2007 in blue, 2013 in red. And I put arrows on to make it a bit clearer. Now, you see that little box in the top right there, which I've highlighted with a red box. That is their total feedback sum. Because they say in the text that there's no real change in the feedbacks between one report and the other. Uh, move along, nothing to see here. 
So I enlarged and enhanced that particular little panel, and this is what I got. You can see major changes. There's been a major reduction in the estimates of the feedback sum between the fourth and fifth assessment reports, a change that has gone entirely unreported so far. Now, what we're going to do is to calibrate the climate sensitivity equation by using the figures from the fourth assessment report for feedbacks and then to use the figures from the fourth assessment report for the range of warming to be expected using the CMIP3 models. And here you can see that what they said would happen was 2.1 to 4.4 Kelvin of warming per doubling of CO2. And if we calculate it from first principles in the way that I've just described, using their values for everything, we do indeed get almost the same figure, 2.2 to 4.4. There are people going around saying, of course, Moncton has misunderstood these feedback diagrams. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. This calibration indicates that I am at least in the right ballpark. Now then, we have to find which of the four new scenarios of emission we should use to do further calculations. And I'm going to use the RCP6, which, as you heard yesterday from one or two of the spokesmen, including, I think, Marcel Kroc, that is the one that is most likely to be realistic. He agrees with me that the RCP8.5, which is described in the IPCC's report as being an extreme scenario, is wildly unrealistic. Now, on the RCP 6.0, they are saying that by 2100, there will be about 2.2 Celsius of global warming. And I say, no, there won't, even if you use their arguments. Now, watch this. First of all, I'm not going to use RCP 4.5 either. I could, because temperature change is well below what that scenario would predict. But no, I'm going to be really... Um, going as far as I can towards the, uh, the, the IPCC, we'll use RCP6. And on RCP6, they're expecting to see around 2.75, maybe at the most 3 watts per square metre of radiative forcing uh, between now and 2100 from all anthropogenic sources. That's about three quarters of uh, uh, the equivalent of doubling CO2. Now, if we have another slightly closer look at that uh, graph of how the feedbacks have been reduced, you can now see I have put figures for AR5 at top right there in red, approximately one and a half watts per square meter per Kelvin of direct forcing, compared with roughly two before. But there's another change we should make, because one of these uh, models they're relying upon, it's actually a French model, we know what the French are like, they tend to exaggerate. Um, they have exaggerated here, and you can see if you convert this table to uh, scale it for climate sensitivity, which I've done in the bar at the top there, you can see how far out this outlier is, and that's what gives you that big mass of pink at the top half of the RCP 8.5 graph we looked at earlier. It all comes from this one model. So we're going to exclude that. It doesn't make much difference to the central estimate, but of course it does make a lot of difference to the upper bound. We've already seen this quotation yesterday that they're no longer prepared to give us a central estimate of climate sensitivity, and we're going to see now why that is. It is because uh, they, they would in fact expect not the 3.3 Celsius that once they said they would expect. That was their previous report. Now, using their newly reduced feedback sum, but keeping all other parameters the same, it comes down to 2.1. They didn't want to admit that, not before the Paris conference. No way, Jose. But that's the equilibrium warming. What I'm now going to do is to look at what will happen. And once again, this calibrates the equation quite nicely because you can see it's 1.7 to 2.7 is the range that we've calculated. And they, on theirs, it's 1.5 to 4.5. But remember, their 4.5 comes from that single outlier model. So now we look at the RCP 6.0 to 2100, this time using only 2.75 watts per square meter of radiative forcing instead of the 3.7 for a doubling of CO2. And so you see that the central estimate we would obtain just doing that brings it down to 1.6 uh, Celsius by the end of this century compared with their 2.2. But there's more, or rather there's less. Because if we look at how the equilibrium sensitivity evolves, and the only paper I know that has ever shown a graph of this is Rho 2009, which is here, and I've added the new feedback estimates to that, you can see that roughly two-thirds only 
of equilibrium forcing will actually occur within 85 years of the forcing arising. And so that takes you down from 1.6 to just 1 Celsius of global warming by 2100 on the RCP6 scenario. And every step of this is mainstream climate science. It's their science. But there's more. Because not all of that forcing occurs straight away. Today, it occurs in little amounts over the century. And that means that you have to divide the amount of warming you get by the end of the century by approximately two. So you're going to end up with half a Celsius of warming between now and the end of this century on mainstream climate science, provided you take all these steps, which they should have taken, and I'm pretty sure that some of them did take them. And they know perfectly well there's not going to be 2.2 Celsius of warming <coughs> on this scenario by 2100. They know perfectly well it's going to be somewhere between 0.5 and 1 at most. So these are the, the scams. These are the frauds. These are the things they're doing. They are grossly exaggerating climate science. And if you put our estimated outturn on their scale, you'll see how harmless it looks and how much overstatement they have indulged in. But there's just two more points I will make before I conclude. The first of these is that an eminent professor uh, with whom I debated this question a few years ago in front of the Law Society of Ireland has rethought his position and has just sent me yesterday a paper which, if it gets published, will reduce equilibrium climate sensitivity to a doubling of CO2 concentration to less than 1 Celsius. And I can tell you that his private view is that it's less than 0.4. You can see the effect of the CMIP-5 models reducing the feedback sum, then the effect of excluding that outlier model, and then the effect of looking at feedbacks that are probably zero. He thinks they're less than zero, as do Lindzen and Choi in 2011 on the right there. Moncton and Brenchley is a little bit more cautious. We're slightly higher. But the new result by this professor is right off the bottom of this chart. And there's still more. And that is that the forcing, which has been stated to be, as I say, 5.35 times the logarithm of proportionate change in concentration, that forcing is now in doubt because there's been no global warming at all in the last 18 years, nine months, even though something like one-third of all the forcings that man has emitted since 1750 have happened in that time. Now, Professor Will Happer gave a talk to the World Federation of Scientists this year in which he produced this graph. And what he said is that they have used the Lorentzian and Voigt line shape equations to demonstrate the radiative forcing, to model in particular the excitation, de-excitation collisions that give you the warming from CO2. They set up a quantum oscillation in the molecule. That oscillation is heat. That's why anyone who says there isn't a, a greenhouse effect needs his head examined. It's very well-established science right down to the quantum level. So... But these equations, which come from optical physics, which is Will Happer's specialism, they assume that those collisions are instantaneous. But they're not. They take a few picoseconds. That means that the radiative forcing from CO2, and hence all radiative forcings over all periods from CO2, are overstated in the current models by 40%. Now, you put that with the fact that Bates is saying only one Celsius of warming per doubling of CO2. You're now down to half a Celsius of warming, not just between now and 2100, but for every doubling of CO2. That's the equilibrium figure. So I'm going to end with this slide here, which shows just how long there has been no global warming. And I think if it gets to 20 years without any global warming, then, frankly, der Tag, der Tag für Freiheit bricht an. We are very, very close now to breaking the back of this scare. Now, at the climate conference in Paris... One of us was told, oh, all you sceptics, you are just old men with grey hair, those of you who are lucky enough to have any. <laughs> we, who are the true believers, we are young with dark hair, and we will watch you die one by one, and then we will triumph. Well, let me end by saying this to them. They have the money, the power, 
and the glory, but they have nothing, and we have everything, for we have the truth.